Okay, it's Thursday and it's a bigotry in America. I'm Jay Fidel, this is ThinkTech. And my old buddy, Peter Hoffenberg, who's a history professor from UH, but who is not speaking on behalf of UH. He just comes with, he comes with a, a lot of resource. I call it intellectual resource. Very nice and of we you. want to ask him very this kind question of you. today. Sorry? Not everybody would agree, but that's very kind of you. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> Thank I'll you. say it again. I'll, I appreciate it. The American Jewish community and the Trump phenomenon is what we want to talk about. And to make it a little nuanced, we're saying it is not a binary issue. It's not a binary issue. Not at all. Not at all. It, the, it, the old saying is, two Jews, three opinions. Exactly. And that's certainly the case. So when I grew up, you know, um, every Jewish person I knew was liberal. And, and to use that, mm -hmm. name, that word, you know, broadly. Um, and in my view right now, today, um, most of the Jewish people I know, most of them, not all of them, um, are liberal. And that means they don't like Trump, they don't like what he's doing, but they're conflicted about Israel. Because it, you, know, that's you, you support Israel, does that mean you have to support Trump? Mm -hmm. To support Trump, does that mean you have to support the, the right wing in Israel? It's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not binary at all. It's mixed binary, <laughs> what right. it is. And so you know, what, what I'd like to ask you is, um, you know, what, what's going on here? Uh, you know, the Jewish people are all immigrants, really, except for the guys who financed the Revolutionary <laughs> War. What was his name? Yeah. Um, actually, I have a student working on that, and my, my memory is going, but you're absolutely right. And, he, and actually, the treasurer for the Confederacy as well. So, so yeah, right? we, <laughs> okay. we sometimes do live up to stereotypes, as Satchel well, Page would say. Yes. Yeah, the thing about it is that, you know, there's a lot of Jews over the, over the years who've been on the side you didn't think. Sure. You know, and, well, they've been on both sides, right. like, like people in general. So, so, you know, where are we here? Uh, first of all, where would you think we would be? And the mm -hmm. second is, where are we? And, and the third is, how do you explain the changes? That's, that's a lot a for lot. half an hour. A lot for half an hour. But so I'll come back. Why you sort of go in with your sure. first reaction? Uh, my, my first reaction, and it's not a surprising one or an unusual one, uh, is there really are many different Jewish communities, uh, even in Hawaii. So you're absolutely right. Politically, uh, very few Jews uh, voted for Trump. Um, generally, Jews uh, supported Obama, um, supported Mrs. Clinton. So politically, most Jews are still registered Democrats. I think uh, what the last few years have done, and this is you know partially Trump, but not entirely Trump, but certainly the president gets the advantage of setting the tone. You know, it's like the economy. No, no president saves the economy and no president ruins the economy. But the critics and the cheerleaders say they do. So, so naive, really. Right. But we could say he's certainly um, a president, and this is not to take a, a political partisan stance, but let's say President Y uh, tweets or says things that he, this current president is saying uh, is going to polarize. And in, and in polarizing, uh, he's been successful with some key wedge issues for Jews. So there isn't really a... Jewish communal response. Uh, there are Jews who need to wrestle with, as you nicely put, the non-binary aspects of this. The yeah. second point I make again, which is not profound in any way, is a lot of what we're seeing has been brewing for a long time. So Israel has been a contentious issue for many, many years. This is not sudden, but again, he's done certain things that have made it more polarizing, but so have his opponents, right? Like the Mod Squad has said things. Um, the question of uh, Jews being liberal on social issues, um, again, kind of cuts two ways. Um, if the Jewish, if when you say the Jewish community, you are including um, very religious Orthodox Jews in that, and the Orthodox community is growing, then since the foundation of their life is a, Jew, is a religious foundation, we shouldn't be surprised if they're not socially liberal. So the Orthodox you know, do not generally go out and support gay lesbian rights. They don't generally go out and support abortion. But that's always been the case, right? But now, um, with this current tone, uh, the uh, idea of religious freedom has now grabbed people more than it did before. So they and others are free to express. So the religiosity has always been there, but the reli religiosity across the board is is freer now. For example, Pompeo, uh, Pompeo, sorry, is. Um, scheduling a, uh, an important conference on human rights. And he's shifting from what has been a 225-year-old understanding ever since the American and French revolutions of human rights 
and is switching it to a more traditional natural rights philosophy, which would mean that freedom of religion is really the only right you have, and everything else is added on. So religiosity, which does divide the Jewish community, right? There are uh, Jews who are atheists, secularists, etc. So uh, that would be my response. There are different communities, right? Some of the issues which uh, the media in particular grab onto have been there for a while. And as we talked about last time, to a certain degree, the governor or the id is just gone. So people feel freer to say and do what they probably realize was not really socially acceptable before. I mean, the, there's almost no limit on, when you think about what people say and do in public these days, there's almost no, it seems to be almost no decency or limit where people have to you know, say, I, I really shouldn't, you know what, I really shouldn't say that, okay? But they don't. They, they do. They, and, they say and, whatever comes Right, and, and sometimes it's because of a, a juvenile sense of freedom. You know, I can do whatever I want. And on social media, right. there is no limit right. at all. And sometimes, and again, I, I, don't, I don't really want to get into Trump bashing. I don't think that's, you know, for us at least, that's not particularly intellectually stimulating. But if, if the government or the state seems to be acting in a way, that certainly gives people some sense that, okay, it's, you know, it's all right. If, if, if the chief executive officers, it'd be like a company. If the mm -hmm. boss is doing something, then, and you then say, well, the worker can't do that. That's a kind of hypocrisy, and we have that sort of tension now. Well, uh, just uh, listening to you know, your reaction, I, I, I am reminded of uh, W. Bush. Uh, when he uh, gave his inaugural remarks, he talked about faith-based, mm -hmm. faith-based based everything, really. Right. I mean, he was directing it at faith-based. Says, what's this? This hasn't happened before, not even with Republicans before. All of a sudden, we're into faith-based, and right. I thought of, all those mega churches in the South and the Southern Baptists and what mm -hmm. have you, who are devoted to you know religion above all. Um, I remember there was one. Uh, gee, was uh, it was a Supreme? This is more recent. A Supreme Court um, candidate who was considered who said that that religion is more important than the well, Constitution. The Bi right, the Bible. She she said the Bible. Yeah, yeah. So not even religion, not the yeah, Quran yeah, or yeah. Hindu texts, but yeah. the Western Western Bible is is where yes, she she made the short list. And shortly after Bush was in office, um, the Department of Justice changed its attitude. Um, the Department of Justice, for example, under Bobby Kennedy, was all about you know religious freedom. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. has freedom, and you you protect uh, you know anybody who is being attacked on the basis of religion. What was that called? Religious freedom from mm -hmm. the First Amendment. Well, um, uh, you're protected from uh, religious discrimination. Right, and, and the Department of Justice up to that point, up to the Bush administration, would go after anybody who, who had attacked religion, uh, religious freedom. But W changed it around. He said, from now on, we are going to defend churches. We're going to defend them. Uh, oh, yeah, it was, the, it was the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. uh, so up to that point, you know, the Department of Justice had been enforcing the Establishment <laughs> Clause. Which uh, regrettably has declined since then. <coughs> Excuse that, me. Almost twenty years ago, mm -hmm. um, and so regrettably, what we have now, what we had then under Bush, was the Department of Justice was protecting churches and advancing mm -hmm. uh, religion. And that's what we have now, right. and I think the Department of Justice is doing that. On P.S. By the way, it's not only the human rights, uh, you know, contortion, mm -hmm. but uh, yesterday I saw that the Department of Justice under William Barr was trying to return to the death penalty. They have, uh, he's identified yeah. five individuals yeah. who yeah. will be executed, yeah. right. Yeah. And that's not incons inconsistent with a kind of, <coughs> excuse me, social and philosophical conservatism, which need not be religious based, but it seems to be in the history of the United States, it's quite often based upon religion or at least justified. There may be other reasons. I mean, we could have a long discussion about racism. I mean, um, inevitably most of those folks who will be executed will be of color, and we certainly almost always all will be poor. So you could also argue that religion might be covering something else, but certainly in the language. I think one, um, one difference might be, um, and you're absolutely right about the faith-based, particularly uh, faith-based social welfare programs. I looked in part at what uh, Shrub was trying to do, was to uh, reduce the welfare state. So rather than have food stamps, the government would support a church or synagogue um, hosting a food bank or something like that. Um, and in his usual way, you know, um, 
he went sort of halfway and then dropped it. So, but this administration and these Supreme Court justices want to push it. But as they push it, it's quite clear that they have a hierarchy of freedoms. And this gets back to the, you know, really the, the issue you asked me to talk about. Uh, you know, for some Jews, religious freedom is the most important freedom, right? For an Orthodox Jew, with all due respect, to be able to worship, to uh, you know, live close enough to the synagogue to walk on Shabbat, that's the most important freedom. And that might very well be matched by non-Jews, and that's the most important freedom. Liberal, more secular Jews certainly, certainly want to feel safe in their synagogue. And the Tree of Life was really a shock to everybody. But I think if you asked um, non-Orthodox Jews what the hierarchy of freedoms would be, for example, many would choose a woman's right over her own body, right? Or the right to housing or something. And religious freedom would not be Well, that's uh, because so the high. Jews are not so religious anymore. Well, but, right. So when we say, though, different Jewish communities, uh, there is a growing religiosity. Um, the two groups that are sort of growing are, are those who are religious yeah. and those who are not identifying themselves as Jews. Yes, well, I, the reform, I, agree. I mean, there's a the lot reform of... and conservative movements are both uh, sort of struggling a little bit. Reform, reform movement is more conservative than it used to be. I mean, my father, father would be shocked. Uh, <laughs> our, our first rabbi, uh, Rabbi Magnin, uh, wouldn't eat shrimp, but not because of being kosher. He worried at a party that somebody had already dipped into the dip, but you know, he was going to get the flu. <laughs> so he always said, "Don't eat, you know, don't dip twice." Exactly. But now you meet reform rabbis who do keep kosher. Um, so the reform, most of the reform movement is getting more religious, more traditional as well. So that's a, that's that's a, a major change. shift a within. Major shift. Oh, it's a major shift. Because you, major know, you shift. started out at Ellis Island, everybody came in at Ellis Island, they were religious. They were identified, identifiable, right. their community was religious in the Lower East Side or wherever they settled in the country, looking for other Jews, looking to share the Jewish religion um, and practicing a Jewish religion and teaching their kids a Jewish religion. Somewhere along the line, a little affluence, you know, changes that. And then the, the nuclear family goes every place in the country. That changes it. And people want to assimilate and intermarry, and that changes it. But before you know it, I, I don't know when this happened, but I think it was the 70s, the 80s anyway, where people started really denying their, their Jewishness and are not talking about it. Going through their whole professional mm -hmm. life, their whole academic life, without telling anybody that they were Jewish, changing their names. Right, uh, and, but and, there was a cost also. I mean, there is that gentleman's anti-Semitism. You know, law firms which would not hire Jews, just as some would not hire Protestants. There's an Arthur Miller uh, novella called Focus, in which he discusses the anti-Semitism that he experienced in the naval yards during World War II. And to tell the story, uh, he tells the tale of a, a man played by Bill Macy, William Macy in the film, who is not Jewish, but he buys glasses like you and I. And when he puts the glasses on, people think he's Jewish. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Right. So, but, but what Miller was saying, right, is there, there was during American history a time when being publicly Jewish came at a, a cost. Um, and, and I think Catholics can appreciate that. I mean, the history well, my of- My parents could. Yeah, I mean, the history of Roman Catholicism in America has generally been Roman Catholics. For yeah. Most of the time, particularly the Irish and Italians, living together in New York, not being hired by Protestant firms. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, part of it was to become American, to assimilate yeah. certainly. And as that happened, right. they weren't so religious anymore, except the Orthodox. Right. I mean, we, they, were, they, they we were all completely. High, holy, high Holy Day Jews, and yeah. as soon as uh, the drosh was done, we went to the LA Open to watch yeah. tennis. So let's talk, about, let's talk about how that impacts their uh, political sure. uh, uh, you know, connection. Uh, so right now, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people who support, a lot of Jewish people who support Trump. There were a lot of people who supported other Republican presidents mm -hmm. along the way. A lot of people in the state of Hawaii who supported Linda Lingle. I mean, uh, you know, she's Republican. So I think there's been a big change, that's hard to say when it started, mm -hmm. of Jewish people who were liberal and democratic, who believed in human rights, who, you know, who cared about uh, the underdog, the disadvantaged, uh, the uh, other racial, um, you know, underdogs, uh, the blacks, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and passionately about that. But somewhere along the line, it started to, started to evolve to something. 
And where, where and when did this happen and why did it happen? Okay, so that's, I think, um, a common perception, certainly a perception the media would like us to see. And in a way, it's a perception that Trump and his allies are trying to exploit. Okay, I think if we step- But it is a reality. It's a reality, um, you know, as my beloved father would say, all worlds are real. But the reality is that uh, come November 2020, 65 to 70% of, of Jews will vote Democrat, if not oh, more. No so uh, what we see is, um, I think the Republican strategy is probably uh, not to get Jews to vote Republican, but to get Jews to stay home. That's more likely. So you know, if the Republicans and Trump can uh, paint the Democratic Party as the party of AOC and Ilhan, uh, they're banking on Jews saying basically to hell with it. I'm not going to vote for Trump. I'm just not going to vote. Or, you know, going and leaving the president. Like, does it but, make that much difference? But, there are only a small percentage well, of Jews in this country. But that's, it's well, the, con it's the, the contributions to the political campaign. But it's also, uh, as we talked about that, it's a classic case of anti-Semitism. Focusing on a small group that you think has disproportionate power. It's as if uh, Pelosi worries that Ilhan will ruin the party, and Trump hopes Il Ilhan will ruin the party, and we're talking about really a small number. But that's, as we talked about, that's one of the classic narratives of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. It's not worrying about wave of immigrants, as anti-Asian sentiment has been, or anti-African-American sentiment about social disorder, which are classic racist ideas. It's a small number of Jews. I mean, Adelson, he's one individual. A small number of Jews will have a disproportionate amount of power. It's as if David and Goliath are kind of intertwined and merged. So to answer your question, though, um, there are, yes, there are members of the Jewish community who see in perhaps not as much what they like about the Republican Party, but have some concerns about the Democratic Party. Now, what are those concerns? Again, they're ones that are pretty long standing, but again, things are just out in the open. So um, I don't think anybody will tell you that all Jews have always agreed about Israel. That's just not true. But it was more true before okay. than it is well, now. Well, what I think has changed is that we, even if we disagreed about what Israel was doing, Israel had a right to exist as a Jewish nation and a Jewish society. And that's really what's at stake here. And that's what we have to be very careful about. So uh, if one believes, right, that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state and is surrounded by folks who would like to remove all Jews from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and there are people in the Democratic Party who seem to agree their old fears are going to come to fruition. Now, there is no way the United States, even if Trump were not president, would abandon Israel. Obama not wasn't going to. Knocking wood. No, Obama that. wasn't going to abandon Israel. Mrs. Clinton wouldn't abandon Israel. Uh, Biden wouldn't abandon. I mean, is Israel's not going to be abandoned. Um, the question would be, you know, should the U.S. assert influence in certain ways? make Israel you know, more open, more democratic. I, I think uh, the Palestinians, uh, the tragedy of the Palestinians is nobody treats them well, which is not excuse Israel, but the Saudis don't treat them well. The Palestinians were primarily in Jordan. They were kicked out. So those are issues, though, which for Jewish voters, they, gotta, you know, they go in the booth and say, well, am I convinced that Trump moving the embassy is a good or a bad thing? Uh, am I convinced that the, the current uh, legislators would like uh, you know, to stomp down on BDS. Is that a, that a good or a bad thing? And you, you kind of have to, you have to weigh it. Well, let me ask you a cause and effect thing, both cause and effect. Why is Trump, the Trump administration, um, so infatuated with uh, the right uh, the, in, uh, in Israel and moving the embassy mm -hmm. in Israel, which is a provocative thing to do? Maybe. Maybe that doesn't get you anywhere. It's very well, provocative. No, nothing I say here represents my employer or my family. Okay. Uh, it was more than provocative. It was uh, a move to basically kill the peace process. I guess so. Yeah. So what, what, what's the cause of that? Why would he do that? 
you know, I've wondered myself, why in the world would he do that? It's just it's okay, so, I think so obviously negative. It doesn't help anybody that I can see. Right. Um, so we have to like, people. like in politics, you got to get try to put yourself on the other side. Yes. To see why they're saying, I mean, not to agree. So I've told you how my personal opinion, which is only my personal opinion, shared by a lot of friends, but I'm not representing them either. I, I think most political scientists and journalists would say there, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, his base includes very active evangelicals. Uh, and evangelicals. No, and uh, you know, with friends like that, I wish the Saudis, <laughs> I wish the Saudis <laughs> lived north door exactly. to me. But that's part of the issue. But that's been an issue for a long time. Um, if, you, if you, you just generically, if one were a member of the Jewish community and said the most important thing is that Israel be strong and Israel have uh, unwavering support from the West, it's a good move. Put in the embassy in Jerusalem, says the U.S. is saying Jerusalem is not an international city. Jerusalem cannot be the future capital of a Palestinian state. It's a Jewish city. And most, I, I, re, I am wary of overgeneralizing, but let's say if we talk about a voting block, the voting block of evangelicals, who ironically vote for somebody who's you know, had 4,000 affairs and 16 immigrant wives. I mean, they don't whatever. Care about that no, they block. don't. <laughs> but they do like Pence. I mean, that was very smart to put Pence in there as the vice president. Mm -hmm. Their idea, as you know, and all your uh, you know, viewers and audience know, that uh, the second coming is you know, around the corner. And the uh, second coming will be in Israel. And uh, non-believers will either die or convert. This is a big plan. Oh my God. And I uh, know it's, it, but uh, we used to have an Israel day here. Um, most of the booths were uh, not Jewish. Many of the booths were uh, Messianic Jews or Christian communities who love Israel. And they love Israel um, not as a Jewish state or society, they love Israel uh, as a stepping stone in the pilgrimage towards the second coming. Now that also affects, apropos your other comments, that means, you know, if, if Israel is most important to me and women's rights are not most important to me, then I'm happy making peace with these conservative Christians because we agree on the most important issue, which gets back to our previous conversation among Jews, what's most important? So, you know, liberal Jews living in Hawaii would say, not only do the Palestinians need to be recognized, and need to be treated decently, um, you know, women's rights, those social issues. Well, all the, are, the liberal issues are right. all conflated. <laughs> right, but you know what? Um, liberals kind of, again, kind of a charged. They're, uh, they are issues of an open, tolerant, modern society. You know, you can take away conservative and liberal. I mean, do, do you want to live in a society where uh, difference is really respected and not just given a uh, token conversation about, but also, you know, diversity within the group? Are you willing to really make a claim for individuals to be truly different and get along? Which so they can. Is that, is that the way the Jewish community feels? I mean, so, I'm putting the Orthodox so liberal, uh, out of that. Well, the Orthodox are, are really rather cool in this way, in the sense that, you know, most, most Orthodox Jews live among themselves. They don't seek to convert. They don't seek necessarily to influence. So in a way, they are very consistent with this idea that separate could be equal. Just let us live peacefully. Mm -hmm. You know, assimilated Jews like us, you know, we're now out in the big community. <laughs> and we have to decide, you know, is this the big community we like? Um, the way the and English it's not binary. No, it's not, not by any means at all. Um, no, I mean I don't think. Uh, I think even back when the first Jews came, it wasn't binary. Because please remember that along with the religious Jews uh, came anarchists, and communists, and labor organizers. I mean, you could read Marx and the Talmud in the same day, and that was not seen to be inconsistent. <laughs> you know, it's the second daughter of the roof who marries, you know, the revolutionary. So there've always been these tensions, but but again. Um, you somewhat knew how to behave with others. And, and, I, and I, that is not an excuse, as some people would say, uh, for a hierarchy, like keep people down. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, just the kind of uh, decency. So, you know, because when people talk about civility and decency, um, they sometimes really mean you should stay where you are. <laughs> you know, you're out of your place. And I don't mean that at all. I mean, just uh, knowing 
knowing words that will get a conversation going, not knowing words that'll get somebody to hit you. And it just seems to be we're more in the get somebody to hit you mode. I, 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 somehow I think that World War II and the Holocaust and uh, being you know, oppressed in so many ways over the centuries mm -hmm. uh, you know, forms, a, forms a, a community that is tolerant, a community that is uh, you know, uh, empathetic with other, other people who are being oppressed. Uh, and that has defined uh, you know, my, my, the people that I know mm -hmm. who are Jewish anyway. So here we are. We're, we're on the cusp of an election. Uh, we're on the cusp, the cusp of uh, Marvin um, uh, thing under uh, Adelson, Adelson mm -hmm. um, who you know supports Trump. Where where Jared Kushner is out there uh, doing what I suppose some people think are you know things that are pro-Jewish. Uh, I'm not sure that's true, mm -hmm. but that's what some people do. I mean, the group do. we the people we talked about before, yeah. uh, especially if you if you support Netanyahu. I mean, if you think Netanyahu is the key to having a secure Israel, then you're definitely in... With Jared and... and yeah, and the Trump with, camp. With, with Trump, yeah. yeah. So, gee, I, you know, the, the problem to me is uh, where, where is the Jewish community going uh, in terms of supporting, in terms of funding, in terms of, um, you know, voting to the extent they do uh, in, in, in this very confused situation? Um, because what's happening, and I, and I speak from my own point mm -hmm. of view, really, I, I'm very non-binary. <laughs> about the whole Israel thing, uh, and I and I really wish that he hadn't done you know, the thing with the embassy. Um, I wish that you know it was the old time without the evangelicals in the, in the mixture. Uh, it's a Jewish state. Come on, <laughs> right, everybody else should get their fingers out of it. Yeah. Right, everybody. Yeah, let's, and the Palestinians would be better off too I, if everybody I'm got their fingers out of it. I'm thinking back to my own time in Hebrew school back when I was a kid, uh, where the kibbutz was, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of the exemplar, the the petri dish how you rebuild uh, Judaism mm -hmm. after the war. Um, but we don't have that anymore, and there's so much assimilation and change. And I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the Jews will stay together in some fashion, uh, although I think these stresses, these political stresses, uh, you know, don't, really, don't really give us, they, they, make it, they confuse it, hence the thing about binary. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how does this really, how is this gonna work? The Jews moving, you feel there's a dynamic here? Are they moving toward Trump? Um, are they moving philosophically toward Trump? Are they tolerating him too much? Uh, shouldn't they be out there in the streets with pitchforks against a guy who, who is racist? And all that. Well, why, why do they tolerate him? Why, and why do well, some of them move in his direction? Okay, um, some move in his direction. I think um, in part uh, for the issues talked about about Israel and particularly his very cozy relationship with Netanyahu. So I, it would be, have been interesting to you know if it were uh, a labor prime minister. Okay, but the two of them have uh, a sycophantic relationship. I mean, it was, uh, it bring, it was bringing it to when Boehner invited Netanyahu to speak before the joint session of Congress uh, that undermined Obama and undermined the Iranian uh, nuclear deal. So this has been going on even pre-Trump. Pre and, and the marriage was with Netanyahu and Likud. Um, and some, some Jews, certainly. Um, I think probably, uh, as you say, there are some who are exceedingly influential. But as a community, as a community, most Jews do not support Trump. And only, as far as Republicans go, support moderates. And, and in, uh, particularly for today, Linda Lingle was a moderate Republican. I mean, in today's, yeah, yeah, in today's so. world. Yeah. I mean, she struck me much more as a, um, an old-time Republican. Uh, much more of a free market. She's getting her signals from old time. Right. I mean, much more of a free marketeer and not so interested in the social issues. Those and, are the people who right, funded her and right. elected her. And, but that was more the old time party. Um, so I would say that uh, to answer your question, there are some uh, active public people who recognize themselves as Jews or others recognize as Jews that support Trump because of Israel. Um, I think. Some of it is because of dissatisfaction with some of the left, some of the left. Um, so for example, when there's a, there's a tweet war or a piece of legislation, which they perceive to be either anti-Israel or at times there have been anti-Semitic comments, uh, they associate that as 180 degrees from Trump. And that you can see Pelosi's problem. She's got to try to control that. 
Uh, so I would say it's the initial question. It's a question whether they feel the Democratic Party is safe for Jews yeah. and Israelis. Good question. Um, I, I think that most, the statistics all show, though, that when push comes to shove, most Jews will not only vote Democratic, but if you look at the people who are protesting uh, the camps, uh, and I'll use the term camps, I mean, they, they are camps the uh, on the border. Um, they were protesting in camps, significant number of Jews, and er almost every major Jewish organization in one way or another. Uh, see, I, I guess part of the difficulty is the labels. See, to me, it's not, it's liberal in the traditional way of opening up society. Mm. But it may not be liberal in the Democratic Party way. At the right. end of the day, the, the thing is visceral, and it, it takes on, you know, your, what you studied at home with your parents. And well, the visceral you... aspects are important here, I think. Um, yeah. The rise, as we've talked about before, of ethno-nationalism. I mean, at some point, Jews have got to realize that if a party allows dangerous idiots with tiki torches to march, and the president says there's some good people there, you got to, I mean, you got to really wonder. That's the kind of ethno-nationalism which uh, Jews are fooling themselves. They might, they might like other parts of the program, but they're fooling themselves if the ethno-nationalism of Bannon, Trump, and his supporters wins out. I mean, Miller, who supports the strict immigration policies, I mean, he's, there's no role for him. He's a West Side Jew. You know, he's, la he's a court Jew, and, you know, he, he will pay. Um, I think that's, that's been uh, a question, ethno-nationalism. Um, globalization, and, and that's a whole other conversation, but as it affects Jews, uh, Jews, you know, have been associated with international finance forever. And those who lose their jobs or perceive they're losing their jobs because of globalization and the economy. Uh, you, you remember the, the PR piece that went out for the Trump administration that had Janet Yellen and other, uh, and it had um, the former Treasury Secretary who was, who was Jewish. You know, there was an international conspiracy, but in this case, it was you know, globalization. All those things have always been there. It's just the Pandora's box has opened now. And when those happen, though, when those happen, um, you'll feel uh, a bit like European Jews who in the 30s thought that I they, do feel, thought that I they do were feel safe. That. I feel but a bit, a bit like. I really don't, I don't think. Well, but it bears watching, don't you think? Um, bears watching. Well, you know the principle. If you refer to Hitler, you lose the argument. You know that. Hitler, may his name be erased. You're right. But it's a Jewish tradition in, argue, in discussion. If your argument depends upon referring to the Third Reich or Hitler, you lose the argument. Okay, so right. if we, let's say, um, should, we bear, should we watch? We should always watch because true freedom, and I don't mean this silly, true freedom uh, is always <laughs> at risk. True freedom. Going back to Nathan Hale. I mean, to be the, to be the individual. Uh, to be able to have the orientation you want in public. And those are at risk, uh, not necessarily from the government, they're at risk from society. The price of liberty. Yeah. With eternal vigilance. Right. Peter Hoffenberg, thank, thank you. you so much. We gotta do this again. Of course, and absolutely. Next time it's global. Right? All right, fair All right. enough, very good. Thank, thank you. you so much. It was a pleasure. Hello.